Thank you, Cara. Thank you, Art Workshops Boulder. Uh, it's really great seeing everybody. It's really lovely. And just to, just over the years, being here and getting to know so many of you and seeing the painting community grow, and um, it's wonderful. Um, and uh, some time ago, uh, I started putting some ideas together for uh, a course on painting and presence, and uh, Cara suggested that perhaps I give a talk now before launching into the course, uh, which will be at the end of October, we'll be beginning that. Um, so what I'd like to do, I'll, I'll start with speaking about some ideas I have about painting and presence. Uh, then we'll move into some slides of work, uh, of paintings. Then questions that might come up. Yeah, we'll go, go into that. And um, so starting with painting and presence, I thought as a nice introduction, we would uh, start with a short video. Some time ago, I found myself working in different ways, trying out different things. Sometimes the emphasis was more on space, sometimes more on form. Sometimes it was an imagined tactility, working in different ways, but all coming at the same situation, the same motif. And when I began to juxtapose the different images on the wall, as I would go from looking at one image to another, from one experience to another, I noticed that my mind kept shifting and I began to find myself noticing spaces in between the images, in between the forms, finding this gap in my mind as I would go from one image to another. In a sense, noticing what was invisible but present. And I began to get interested in what is underneath everything, inside everything, exploring the relationship between form and awareness. What is the relationship between form and awareness? And uh, let's start with presence. When I speak of presence, I mean the simple daily experience of something being here. Here it is. It's present. It has presence. I, I am here. I have presence. You are here. You have presence. And sometimes there's a strong sense of presence. Something is really here. I think of nature. Being in the middle of a forest, that dense quiet. Being by the ocean, that calm vastness. Sometimes with people, we sense them strongly. Sometimes an object that little vase that we suddenly see clearly holding the space. Perhaps fresh flowers that are standing present and opening, looking back at us. They have presence. And sometimes with art, painting, we may notice its presence. We may be walking through a museum, strolling easily or pressured for time and something catches our eye. We may even 
feel it before we see it. And we come up close, and this thing, this painting, has presence. It seems alive. It is somehow alive. So what's going on? Let's look a little deeper into the nature of presence. In The Power of Now, by Eckhart Tolle, he writes, Have you ever gazed up into the infinity of space on a clear night, awestruck by the absolute stillness and inconceivable vastness of it? Have you listened, truly listened, to the sound of a mountain stream in the forest, or the, to the song of a blackbird at dusk on a quiet summer evening? To become aware of such things, the mind needs to be still. You have to put down for a moment your personal baggage of problems, of past and future, as well as all your knowledge. Otherwise, you will see but not see, hear but not hear. Your total presence is required. Beyond the beauty of the external forms, there is more here, something that cannot be named, something ineffable. Whenever and wherever there is beauty, this inner essence shines through somehow. It only reveals itself to you when you are present. Could it be that this nameless essence and your presence are one and the same? Let's put it this way. In order for me to see that little vase, to see the flowers, in order to catch the painting, I need to be attuned to them. I need to attune to them in order for us to meet. And there's the possibility that it isn't actually a question of meeting, but of recognition. That we already are connected, and the awareness of their presence is an awareness of our forgotten bond, a kind of friendly recognition or remembering. So awareness and presence are intimately related. In truth, awareness and presence are the same thing. Tolle continues, when you become conscious of being, what is really happening is that being becomes conscious of itself. When being becomes conscious of itself, that's presence. Everything has being or it wouldn't be. When we meet something and slow down and really meet it, being meets being. And that is presence. So, if everything, every object, every painting carries presence, why do some paintings seem stronger, seem to carry more presence than others? And this question brings us to the question of the relationship between presence and making. Because the answer to the question has to do with the process of making the painting and the state of awareness of the painter during that process. A lot of us here are, are painters. Hey. Hi, we make stuff. So it becomes an important question. How do I make a painting that is strong? And by strong here, I mean it has strong presence. Something about it compels. It is here. As painters, as us, learning to be painters, there is often a long journey. First, there is a period of gathering. We're learning skills, how to draw, how to mix color, how to touch and control the material but also how to organize and unify everything on the canvas, how to make some kind of wholeness there, that is, how to compose. And we gather influences, other painters, important teachers, great masters whose work inspires and ignites us. And we experiment with different ways of working, testing various attitudes, discovering unknown sympathies and questions. 
then there is a period of integration in which we start to synthesize and put together all of these skills and influences and begin to find a way of painting that feels like us, our way. We begin to feel more at home with our own work. And then a second kind of experimentation begins. This time, not so much to discover what kind of painter we are, as much as to explore our own intimate questions and concerns. Experimenting is a way of investigating and being close to what we care deeply about in our lives. Here, the experimentation is more like an open... <laughs> it's okay. Here, the experimentation is more like an open-ended engagement with our work, with our painting. It is living our life in and through the paint. Now, let me back up and look again at what I just described through the lens of presence. When we first begin our journey and our learning skill development, essentially what we are doing is integrating our hands, eyes, mind, perception, and materials. We are creating a unified system that will allow for a directness in touch, a kind of intelligent, aware, engagement in paint. Our inner life gains more access to a more fluid expression in the material. Our life force moves more directly into the paint. The separation between what we think of as ourselves and what we think of as our material begins to break down and at times even disappear. And the material begins to take on more presence. As we encounter important teachers and discover inspiring painters and masters, essentially we are discovering our own potentialities, what lies waiting within us. Their teaching, their painting, strikes a chord within us. This is how I long to paint. Here, this is my life force. This is my direction. Again, more presence. When we experiment with different ways of working, different modalities, we are in a process of locating temperamentally, energetically, what is the way for me to catalyze my energy and get my life force into my work as fully and directly as possible. Presence. When I practice composition as an ongoing discipline, that is, being sensitive to and adjusting the various formal elements in an ongoing open process, moving the painting and all of its disparate elements to wholeness, I am practicing awareness with a caring, intelligent attention over the whole surface. No aspect un unattended, no transition, no edge unseen, unfelt, uncared for. This attention imbues the work, steeps it in awareness. As I integrate all of these influences and begin to paint in the most personal way, as I experiment and explore the questions and experiences that most deeply engage me, my life is lived in the paint. Mary Jane Jacob, in Buddha Mind and Contemporary Art, puts it this way. The artist's mind in making is not just the result of studied knowledge, getting the facts straight, or skills acquired, it is always determined by the actual process of making and the depth of awareness one brings to bear during that process. The work of art derives its presence from this heightened awareness, from the artist's presence of mind. This life force, this awareness, in the act of painting, activates the material, opens it, wakes it up. And all that life, all that juice in the material creates strong presence. Presence to be met by a receptive, attuned viewer. Being meeting being. Life meeting life. So we paint. Taking this interaction between painter and viewer 
Further, we might say that painting actually acts as a kind of weave. If what is occurring through the interaction between painter and viewer is a sending and a receiving, the painting is functioning like an energetic weave of maker and receiver. And the stronger the presence, the more vibrant and myriad the threads. In our materially based culture, we tend to think in terms of isolated bits rather than interconnected processes. We think of painting as an object, albeit a, a wonderful aesthetic object, but an object among other objects nonetheless. But the nature of a painting is more dynamic than that and more radiant. A radiance powered by the energetic presence of awareness of the maker, the painter. A radiance ceaselessly shining as the painting continues to exist in the world to be received by all who are open to receive it. When we are engaged deeply and fully in our making, the sense of separateness from ourselves, the motif, the material, the world, this separateness begins to dissipate and dissolve. Our awareness doesn't disappear. We don't disappear. We are just more fully connected. For the viewer of our work who is attuned to receive it, this loss of separation that we experience as makers is available as a loss of separation for the viewer in relation to the painting. This intimacy with the painting becomes an experience of wholeness, not only with the painting, but with the world. Sometimes this experience is referred to as the aesthetic emotion. And it is what Herbert Marcuse describes as the true revolutionary quality in art. Once I taste this wholeness, how do I live and act accordingly? And what, is, what else is possible? What are the implications for our world? Rupert Spira describes this collapse between self and object as that which we usually call beauty. Here are more of Spira's words. Art heals the fundamental malaise of our culture, the feeling of alienation, despair, separation, the longing for love. We do not view a work of art, we participate in it. The nature of art is to bring the world that we have rejected, the world that we have deemed other, separate, made out of dead matter, to bring it close, intimate, to realize ourself as one with its very fabric. It is not a relationship made of seeing or hearing. That is too distant. It is a relationship of love intimacy and immediacy. An artist is simply one who doesn't forget the freedom, innocence, freshness, and intimacy of experience. The role of the artist is to transmit to humanity the deepest experience of reality. Art is remembrance. It is love. For us as makers, as painters, Imbuing our paintings with presence means dropping into the act of painting wholly, relinquishing willful control, letting go of thought, opening to risk to the unknown, daring to take it further, to fail, to fall, and all the while opening further from the inside, vulnerable and engaged and aware and present. Now, I thought I was going to stop there and go to slides. And then this morning, it occurred to me that there's another thing I wanted to say. So I just kind of put it in an email to myself. So here it is. One second. Let me see if I can find this. Yeah. So I'd like to add something here, if I can read this. Here we go. About the process of making, the actual decision making and marking from this place of of vulnerability and openness. When we move into this place of vulnerability, this place of open boundaries, the actual mark making takes on a curious quality. There is something like what we would call decision making, 
but it isn't quite the firm, individualized decision-making that we usually think of. It feels more like collaboration. There is a clarity, but it may not be exactly my clarity. Somehow, something is occurring, and I am involved. But it doesn't feel quite like my doing. It is an open situation. I am making decisions, but I am also following. But of course it is my making, and yet not. There is this open situation that I do not know how to put into words because it does not quite fit into thought. It is too close for that, too actual. The painting is getting made, and I am somehow involved and watching and grateful. So, we learn our skills, locate what is real for us, show up, and paint. So those are the prepared remarks. Um, so now I thought we would look at some slides before going into like questions and conversation. And this summer, uh, I had the great fortune of uh, seeing all kinds of amazing painting. Um, we'll go through some of that. I couldn't show all of it. So let's see if I can get this back on. Here we go. We're in business. So, right, there was this fabulous uh, portrait show of Cezanne's portraits at the National Gallery in Washington. I went with Paul uh, earlier in the summer. And uh, we can't see all of it, but it was I mean, so what I, I've tried to bring things now that were experiences for me of paintings that just carry enormous presence. Um, and uh, I took some, some details. And um, along with seeing the paintings, part of what we'll see are s some drawings I was doing while I stood in front of the paintings as a way of uh, I guess in a sense, attuning to, receiving, participating with the work. Um, yeah, I don't... You know, I was thinking about what am I going to say about all these paintings? And... <laughs> well, I will say one thing. I mean, that just about looking at reproductions in general is they really work better as memory triggers because uh, often it's hard to get a hit through the reproduction of the real energetic impact of a painting, the presence of a painting. Uh, but if you know the work and you look at a reproduction, it's like there's a, a kind of memory gets triggered, you know, almost like an energetic memory. So that was uh, one of the drawings I did of that Cezanne as I was standing there. And one of the things that, uh, that I often do when I'm drawing from something and trying to, in a sense, commune, is I, I don't really look at the paper so much as at the thing I'm looking at. And I let my hand just kind of go. And then you get a kind of quirky, fun accident, too. Anyway, that's, you'll see some of that sort of thing happening. And this was uh, Voyard, right? His portrait of Voyard, I think. Collector. And uh, you get a lot of glare because uh, of the way the figures worked. And so it was hard to get a good image. But you do without some of the, those pops. But you got a sense of the texture of this thing and how, how much he worked on it. That's a little better. What was it, like 100 sittings or something? Cezanne, uh, not, not Vuillard, the, the painter, Vollard? Vol, Maybe it's Ambroise Vollard. Does anyone know how to say his name? And seeing this stuff was, oh, look. This Paul. This Paul. <laughs> so you got a sense of the size. He's not the one in suspenders, the other guy. <laughs> Yeah. 
And that's my drawing of it. Yeah. Is it cracking, Jordan? No, that's not cracking. It is a glint of reflection off of the surface and just the way that it was lit and what I could do with my camera. And this, this, this reaper, God, I've been looking at a reproduction of this thing for decades and never saw it until this show. It's better uh, in life than the reproduction. It's really a little blurry. He's, God, you can't get it all. You know, and drawing in front of the paintings, right, it, I mean, is, you know, you can be asking all kinds of things. You can be exploring all kinds of aspects of it, the composition or little details or the overall or just, just having your hand move while you look at the thing just ends up changing the experience of seeing. Ah, terrible. That hand is outrageous. It's like a claw. And then we went to uh, the Phillips collection because there's a, uh, we went to see this group of contemporary Aboriginal women artists and couldn't not just see what else was going on. Yeah, I, I, it was flabbergasting what they had there. Just a couple of them. Uh, right, that was a, a Van Gogh and then a, a Bonard, yeah. And then here we are uh, in that show of the Aboriginal women, and just that gives you a sense of the size of this thing. That, that and then a little detail. And the work was just, it was jaw-dropping. Again, about presence, it was like, it was like walking into some kind of magic land where you had these images. It was just marks, little marks, that's all. But they carried this charge that was, it was, it was alchemical. It was something else. Yeah, right? I, I was like, whoa, totally mesmerizing. Of course, my, my battery was, was, was dying on my phone, so I, had, I couldn't take all the pictures I wanted either. It was like, oh, no. Oh, and then we're at the other part of the National Gallery, and there was uh, the, this threesome of some Mirandis. And then there was Rembrandt. When I, when I think of presence in painting, the, my first thought always is Rembrandt. Something happens in front of his painting, particularly his self-portraits for me, that I, I just, uh, I get like caught. It just, I just, like in a tractor beam, you know, and I like just, it just holds something else. Oh, and then there's this, uh, it was Venus and uh, Adonis. Uh, again, I thought I was, <laughs> I thought I was going to walk around and see a lot of the collection that morning. It was our last morning. And I got stuck in, it was a couple hours I was in front of this thing. <laughs> I was like, I mean, really, maybe an hour and a half, I mean, easily. 
I don't know. Who asked me? Yeah, I. I don't know. It was. Uh, I mean, I found it beautiful, and uh, it really just kind of. Uh, I don't know, it captured me. I don't know. And I just wanted to keep drawing it and taking pictures. I took more and more pictures and kept drawing different things. And, and uh, I mean, it wasn't just the narrative of it. And somehow it wasn't just like, well, that's really nicely painted. Uh, did I say it's a Titian? No. Titian. It's pretty, pretty big. Um, not that big, but a good part of that. And so uh, she wants to be with him, and he wants to go hunting. That's the story. Not much has changed. <laughs> and, and he's like, what's going on? What's this? She ends up and the, killing him. Yeah, something like that. No, no, he gets, he gets killed, but she knows it's coming. And the dog, the dog is like, let's go hunting, let's go hunting. <laughs> and he is a fool. <laughs> and the, maybe that's Eros or an angel. Anyway, he's looking on like, what's wrong, what's wrong with him? Okay, then uh, another trip. Uh, went to New York. There was a Soutine show and a Giacometti show in New York. And um, the Soutine was, uh, they called it flesh. It was all dead animals. I think the, the, uh, one review said it should have been called meat. <laughs> so we have dead turkeys. A bunch of them. And it is, I mean, his touch, his color, the sensitivity, the surface, the, the abandonment, the engagement, and the, the agony of these animals. I had the good fortune to be there. Uh, Louise Fishman was giving a talk, so I got to hear her talk about her relationship to Sutine, and that was great. And a bunch of meat carcasses, uh, beef carcasses. And again, you know, like seeing the reproduction, I mean, see, being in front of this stuff, uh, the touch, the sensuality, the material. Flayed ox. And the Giacometti. And this is, this, here's a detail. And you get a sense of his, his engagement with it. He's, he's in there going, paring down his, uh, formal problem to black and white, little mark, right, as a way of clarifying for himself that engagement. Taking out things that are extraneous. So as he's working, he gets more and more directly in the painting, in the making. S same with the routine. I mean, all of them are doing that. All, all, all great painters are doing that. They're figuring out how to get as much of themselves into the work as possible. Titian, at the end of his life, he's painting with his hands. What's that? Well, he was an old man. Well, no, but painting with your hands. Well, you know. This is a portrait of, uh, I think, Jean Genet. 
You got that right? Is that oil? Yeah, it's all oil uh, until like the 60s, yeah. Hmm. So that's so George, me going at it. Huh? When, if you would go back one, is it, that really reminds me of what you do a lot. Well, I'm very influenced by Giacometti, very, very much so. And somewhere along the line, as I was working and painting when I was younger, and I had been looking at him, and then realizing, oh, he's coming through my work. It's, I'm, oh yeah, I'm indebted. That's, he's... Now, now there are these, and they're really hard to see. And these came before that, and before the one that we saw before. This is when he's starting to figure out what he wants to do with his painting and portraits. And he's just in it. Is that his wife? N no, that might be his brother. That's another one. And they're so, I mean, he's just, they're illegible. They're just, he's just inside this thing as he's working. And of course, he's not thinking, what are they going to, are they going to like it? Will they understand it? Could I, can I sell it? <laughs> Clearly, that's not going on. <laughs> right? He's just in it. And he ends up changing the course of painting because of that. He goes in it, Cezanne, clearly, right? Rembrandt dies poor. That was my take. Oh, okay. So now we leave New York. I'm in London at the Tate Britain, the All Too Human show, which was unbelievable. Uh, and this was a, is, a, is a painting that I'd been looking at for over 25 years in reproduction by David Bomberg. And uh, it's about this big. Some of you have heard me talk about this. We've seen it in class. Um, seeing this thing was just mind-blowing. All of that stuff going on there. All that, that's a, the town of Toledo looking from Alzacar or something. Is it getting blurred out? Maybe it's a little blurry. It's all very specifically hit as he's looking at all that. And it's, I mean, it's crazy. And we're looking down, right? There's the, the tower, a little, you know, like some building, and looking in an alley in the streets and all these houses. Oh, and here, here is an Auerbach, an early Auerbach. I think he's maybe in his 20s. It's biggish, maybe, maybe about that size or a little bigger. Uh, can't get the density of paint, really. I kept trying. It's an excavation site after World War II. Bombed out London. They're rebuilding it. Here, that gives you a sense of the size of the thing. And some of the meatiness of the paint. And, and again, another attitude. Here, he, he, uh, he would use black, white, uh, Indian red, and yellow ochre because they're cheaper. And he could buy bucketfuls of this stuff because he needed to do that to do what he needed to do to make his painting. This is a Kossoff. Uh, Leon Kossoff, friend of uh, Frank Auerbach's, the uh, a little older than him. Again, he's, he's maybe 30, 31, something here. 
It's a biggish painting. This is another excavation site. Mounds of paint in this thing. Gives you a sense of the size. There's a ch church in the neighborhood where Kossoff grew up. Big painting. So here's a, 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 a Ewan Uglo. And uh, again, great presence, very different attitude. If those guys were all about like getting lost in it, in the thickness of the paint, and the, right? He's real analytic, real slow that way, very different engagement. But what serves him temperamentally to get his life force into the work? All the measuring, locating. This was his teacher, uh, William Coldstream. One of Coldstream's paintings is in the upper uh, left corner of that, and then he's got this little lemon bush. This is a little portrait by Lucien Freud of Frank Auerbach. This is uh, Lucien Freud's mom. And you get, you get a sense of, again, the engagement, the inside. Lee Bowery, another portrait. Those, those little dots, those are, uh, that's just a reflection of the lights on the glass. This is another Frank Auerbach. He's older, uh, so his painting, his handling is different. This is a portrait of his son. His son is now maybe in his 30s, I think. And what we're, you know, part of what we're seeing, it's not that we're looking at different styles of painting. We're looking at different physical expressions that painters are finding that will enable each of them to get as much life force and presence into the work as they can. And so it becomes what we call from the outside style. But really we're looking at their way of living in their work, in their, in their painting. So now, okay, we've left the uh, all too human, and we're in the National Gallery in um, uh, London, as opposed to the National Gallery in Washington with the Cezanne. And uh, just a few things here, um, although there are just tons there. This is uh, Piero della Francesca, the, the what? Nativity? I think it's the Nativity, right? Should know this. It, yeah, I think. Yeah. I think that's the maybe it's the nativity. And uh, God, e every everything in a Piero is alive and has an inner life. The people, 
the cloth, the animals, you'll, something else. You know, it was like, and I don't even try to get it looking at the slides, but and as, as powerful as all that work was looking at the, in the Tate Britain, and then you go to the National Gallery looking at a Piero, looking at the Titian, looking at the Rembrandt, it goes on and on. And the amount of presence in the, their work, it was just staggering. And I don't know whether I'm, am I being nostalgic or, I don't think so. I think somehow they were able to tap into, focus, gather in a way that's harder, maybe. I, I don't know exactly. It's harder now? Maybe. Yeah, maybe it's harder now. Maybe we have more distractions. Maybe. I I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know. Beautiful. Oh, there's something else. Yeah. There's a cow. Great cow. I mean, that cow is awake. <laughs> That's my something in relation to it, just being with it. Uh, this is the death of Acteon by Titian, late Titian. So Acteon, you, you, he, just was, he just wanted to go out hunting. He didn't, he didn't mean to spy on Diana bathing. She didn't like it. So she turns him into a stag, and his hounds turn on him. That was his ending. So there he is over on, uh, on the right side. His hounds are going after him, and she's taking no prisoners. And I, I don't know exactly, again, what it is about the Titian. I mean, I, I mean, I could talk about all kinds of things, but this, for me, is one of the most mind-blowing paintings I've ever encountered. It is so full of mystery. There's, there's that forest, the grove, there's a horse and a rider in the back of that. There's the, the dark stormy sky. Someone asked, someone was asking in class about her breast. It's like, come on, really? We need to have a bare breast on this. And then it occurred to me that that ends up implicating me as the viewer into Acteon's situation. And so I'm trapped in there too. This color. Yeah. The blue uh, is a reflection. That's not in the painting. That the must red is his, though. The blue? The red is the his. Red is his. Yeah, yeah. And the exposures suck. <laughs> it's, it's really. Uh, getting up close, you can't. You, I couldn't get it. I got too much reflection. Was it that loose? Oh yeah. Just he's it really is. Yeah, he's just. It's very loose. And these are a few of mine here. And then there is this little Zuberon, little, quiet, little still life. And I had just enough power left in my phone. Take a couple more pictures. My little rendition. And I think, yeah, that's it. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, any thoughts, questions? Yeah, sure. In the Uglo, yeah. His teacher. William Coldstream. They were like 
red and green line yeah. that were vaguely showing through this very muted color painting. What were they doing under there? So uh, Jacqueline's asking, the Ooglo and the William Cole stream, there are these lines. What are they doing with those lines in their paintings? They're measuring. Where are things in relation to other things? And they're, so the, the process of measuring and locating is part of the, of the painting itself. The content of looking for is part of the content of the painting. It's not just a, a bush or a woman sitting. It is the uh, uh, looking for the situation. Uh, yeah? So. I wonder why they used red and green. Why red and green? Bright, you know, bright colors in this otherwise quiet painting. So maybe they could see it? Yeah, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? If, if you think of a realistic cave painting of the walls, you know, like the ones in France, can you imagine those? The, like in the, like Lascaux or, yeah, sure. the Lascaux paintings? Yeah, sure. How, how, how do you think the two the modern, these more modern, obviously, images and the intention of that type of image, how, how, how would you interpret the Lascaux? Would you, would you interpret them the same way? How, so I'm just going to repeat it so that it gets, also I'm recording, so hopefully. So how would the Lascaux paintings, uh, would, how, would, I, would I come to them in the same way as I'm talking about these paintings from the Renaissance through the contemporary or modern? Um, yeah, I would. I, I think what we're looking at is Human engagement, human spirit engaging with the material. And that there is something fundamental about being human that is that. And we, so that the impact of that work in Lascaux and all, you know, and all through and all over the planet, it, it, there is some kind of energetic charge that occurs. And I think, um, and that that's, has so much to do with why when we encounter work from all over and from whenever, could be thousands of years old, but when we encounter it, it's current, it's present, it's, con it's contemporaneous to us now, energetically. It doesn't feel right. If something is real, it's real now. So, all of, yes, I would, I come at it the same way, you know. I mean, it's always, and of course there are things that have to do with the particulars of a culture and the particulars of a, you know, of, of, of circumstances that add to things, of course, immeasurably, and are important. And yet, there is this uh, aspect of presence that um, exists outside of all of that, always, you know, yeah. Something else? Anyone? Yeah? You spoke about a portrait that had a hundred sittings, and yet, visually, to me, looked really fresh and sort of immediate in a lot of ways. So that was yeah. really surprising to me. Yeah. And one of the struggles in painting is to kind of maintain some freshness and mm -hmm. not overwork things and all of that. Mm -hmm. It seems like that doesn't have a direct correlation to what you're talking about in presence. So let me just say out again. Yeah. So. If, if, if a paint, how does, how does a painting maintain freshness over a long period of time, and what is the relationship of that aspect of freshness to presence? Yeah, like, sure. Is that? Sure. Is that it? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so, part of the task as painters is to maintain that freshness even as something gets developed and carried further. I'm not closing it down, I'm making it whole. 
it still needs to, you know, when Matisse or Diebenkorn, the way they work, they're, they're getting closer. There's an end game there. They arrive at something. And that arrival goes through a great deal of, of process. It doesn't happen all at once. And somehow they need to find a way to arrive at that full expression and maintain their freshness. And that freshness, in, terms, in, in relation to the terms I'm talking about, has to do with a full-blown vitality that allows for me to, I need to somehow maintain uh, my uh, full life engagement as I work. And one of the problems that we face as we take a painting further and further is the risk of blowing it gets higher and higher, gets bigger and bigger. And, and we need to, the stakes get bigger as, oh, we're getting closer and closer, and I need to keep on risking. Because if I don't maintain that attitude, I'm going to close down. De Kooning called it, uh, you need to be on an edge all the time, or the painting dies. So it gets scary. It's one thing, you know, you start a painting, and it's like it's all, it's all open, you know? You know, you're having a, a great dance. Fabulous. Well, what, what about when, you, you know, it's like something, something starts to take on a reality to it. Then you don't want to blow it. But then if you hold it too tight, then it gets lost. You, you kill it. And so then it becomes even riskier. How do I maintain that openness? How do I maintain that sense of risk as I uh, take it further? And how does that correlate with presence, though? Is I must. Directly? Yes. Directly? directly correlated to presence because without that sense of openness that will allow for presence to to occur in my making there it'll shut down and that openness demands is is uh, is inseparable from the risk I can't protect my painting as I bring it to fullness so openness equals risk equals presence yes okay. yes and if I if I try to play it safe because I don't want to blow it, I'm going to come up with a very safe painting. And that's going to be, okay. <laughs> Another okay painting. Yeah. Anyone else? Fabulous. So, um, yeah. Oh, I, I, thank you. So I'm going to be giving a, um, a six-month course on painting and presence. Uh, it'll be a low residency course. So there'll be uh, three uh, four-day intensives spread out over six months. And uh, once a month, they will... So that'll be low residency. So we'll do them here, but people can live far away and come in for them. Um, and in addition, there'll be once a month uh, online video conferencing, uh, where we will be in touch, uh, keeping uh, on tabs. There will be readings that we'll be uh, engaged in that will inform the work that we'll be doing in the intensives. Uh, there will be weekly, a weekly schedule of work that we'll be doing at home, that will, uh, of exercises dealing with painting and presence. Um, um, the first intensive will be about our own relationship to presence, uh, locating for ourselves temperamentally how to work. The second will have to do with presence in relation to the world. How do I want to share this in relation to the world? The third will be aspects of non-duality um, in, in relation to my painting practice. And I am not a non-dual teacher, but um, um, I'm deeply interested in it. And, and so it'll be a journey for all of us exploring those issues. Um, the course will be beginning at the end of October and then finishing up in May. Um, there'll be uh, a, a few different, there'll be five different books that we'll be uh, uh, looking at and reading different things that will be informing our exploration. Um, if you're interested, there's some flyers and uh, 
contact me. Yeah? Is it something that you uh, have to take each session if you're not able to? The first one, the first session is very, is sort of critical. Without that first one, coming in for the second and the th or the third would be difficult. Um, well, we can talk about it. Yeah. Anyone else? Do you want to say what the books are? The books? Sure. There's um, a book that just came out recently called <laughs> Encountering the Spiritual in Contemporary Art, uh, edited by Lisa Fanning, who was um, a curator at the Nelson Atkins Museum in the Kansas City. And a fabulous, fabulous book. Uh, another book is Buddha Mind in Contemporary Art, edited by Jacqueline Bass and Mary Jane Jacob. Another book is True and False by David Mamet. Um, another one is The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible by Charles Eisenstein. And Presence Volume 1 by Rupert Spira. Those are the five different books. And it's on, it's on the website, uh, thepaintingproject.org. What else? Anything else? Any yes? Did I see any good work in Ireland? The, I did. I did. The National Gallery. There were some lovely things. I, ha I had to edit out. I didn't, pu I didn't put everything in here. But yeah, some beauties. Yeah. D Michelle, did you? Yeah, Jordan, how big is that class? How many? How many people? Maybe eight. Smallish. Yeah. So we can all work in the studio during the intensives. Well, thank you all very much. It's a pleasure seeing everybody.